Good morning, Cornerstone family and friends. It's great to have you today. As we enter into the fall season, one of the things that keeps coming to my mind is how Jesus said, my father's house is a house of prayer. And so this morning, I just want to talk a little bit about growing in our faith and, and developing our prayer life. As we venture into this journey of faith, it is a process of learning and developing and growing. And prayer is one of those venues of where we learn how do we learn to pray effectively and how can we pray wisely. I came across an example of Carl Thomas, who is an example of a, of a man of prayer. He is a chaplain, or was a chaplain, sorry, at uh, Campus Crusade for Christ in Orlando, Florida. And when he was 73 years of age, he'd wake up in the morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, and he would pray and intercede for about an hour. And after he did that, he'd walk through um, the office, and there's about a thousand employees there in all their cubicles, and he would stop, and he would pray, and he would engage with them, and just check in on what he could pray for. He stated this comment, he said, the purpose of prayer is to build a relationship with God, which helps bring a deeper connection with God. Prayer is really a kingdom language, not just mere words. When you pray, you have stepped into God's dominant, sovereign will to bring about his kingdom on earth. You know, when it comes to prayer, there's so many necessary ingredients to really develop a, a healthy prayer life. And one of the things that we need to look at is the discipline of prayer. Um, when we think of prayer, a lot of times it's a place where we can stop and, and reflect, where's a nice place where I can, for me to just get away and I can concentrate on what I want to talk to God about. So location is very important. In fact, when we look at uh, location and space in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it tells us that Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. So for him, going at night and praying at a mountain where it's a little bit quieter from all the busyness of the day was a great place for Jesus to go and pray. And then also the time of prayer. In Mark 1, 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So even Jesus demonstrates the example of connection with God through prayer, our talking, our converse, conversations, our our concerns, our worries, our issues, and we bring them before God. You know, when it comes to prayer, we need to have good attainable goals. You know, when you start off with prayer, you know, it's really hard to just jump into an hour of prayer time, isn't it? And so it's just beginning the process of um, finding that space, that time, and committing yourself to prayer and, and dedicating yourself to a time where you can set aside to just focus and, and think about God and his scriptures and how it applies to your life, and then to bring to him the the, the thanksgiving and the praise that you would love to offer, but also that it's a time where you can communicate what's going on in your life with God. When we set attainable goals to start prayer life, we can work, you know, maybe starting off with five, 10 minutes and then growing as we become more accustomed to prayer and engaging in conversation with God. We also need to take the time to put away any kind of interruptions that may distract us. You know, a lot of times we're bombarded by social media and our cell phone, and we can set those things apart for just a certain time so we can just focus our heart towards God. One of the most effective ways in um, maintaining a prayer life is also to start a journal and to record maybe the day that you started praying about something and then indicating when that prayer was answered uh, or how God is beginning to change hearts or dealing with things that you're bringing up to him in prayer. In Genesis chapter 18, there's an account of um, God coming and speaking with Abraham. And uh, while he was speaking with Abraham, the concern was happening in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and also the surrounding territory. And uh, God was concerned about what was taking place. And there was a conversation that Abraham had that I, I find is such a an interesting and also helpful understanding of, of communicating one's concerns and intercession on behalf of others uh, to God. And it goes into that passage of scripture. There's a part where it says, um, you know, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike, far be it from you. This is what Abraham is saying to God. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find 50 people, 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up, now that I've been so bold to speak to the Lord, although I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the righteous of, uh, of that city is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five people? If I find 45 there, God said, I will not destroy it. Once again, Abraham spoke up, what if only 40 are found there? 
For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Well, Lord, please don't be angry with me, but let me speak. Um, what if only 30 can be found there? And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said again, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 uh, can be found there? And God answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And lastly, he says, Lord, please don't be angry, but let me speak one more time. What if there's only 10 that can be found in the city? And God answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. You know, the passage of scripture there, what really stands out to me is the dynamic of Abraham being able to converse his heart and his concern for the people and the and and making sure that, that there could be a, a potential for sparing. And what I want to point out there that is so wonderful is that God, even as he spoke with Abraham, if it was 50, 45, 30, 20, 10, what I see there is just the, the long suffering and kindness and love of God that not wanting anyone to perish. And, and God wants us to come into relationship with him. And the beautiful part about relationship is that we can pray just like Abraham was speaking to God and, and praying on behalf of people by interceding on, the, on their behalf. In the same manner, we're given that chance to do that as Christians, where we can pray for the needs that are around us. We can pray for people. You know, a lot of times we're asked to pray about different uh, serious illnesses and issues of cancer and strokes and heart attacks and, and the things that have happened to people. And then we, we come together and we pray and we ask God for not only healing, but we pray for strength to help those individuals in those times and their families and those that are loved ones associated to them. I love this passage of scripture because it really shows that Abraham's heart is to be an intercessor, one who is really concerned about the welfare of people to care, to, to pray, bring these things before God's in, in, uh, attention. And so the question arises, what really is an intercessor? It's one who mediates in prayer on behalf of others. He, he or she seeks to know God's will. They want God's will fulfilled and his glory revealed. And often we find in scripture, prayers offered to God through um, Christ, uh, who intercedes on our behalf, who is our mediator. We know that Abraham was a man that walked with God and that walking with God begins with that relational dynamic of talking and engaging and trusting and faith building. He's encouraged to do what is right. And, you know, when we when we serve God, the, the journey of our faith arises from time to time with challenges and difficulties that will will test us and they'll make us um see God in those times and those hardships that we may understand his purposes and his will in our lives. But as we pray, as we begin to bring our own concerns before the Lord, we also become sensitive to the fact that there's others around us that need prayer. And there's been many times where in my own personal life where I've had God speak to me in the middle of the night and wake me up from my sleep and, and impress upon me that I need to pray for somebody or for a family or for a situation. And uh, I, I've often tried to um, do that as God has prompted my heart to pray and bring those things to me. Even throughout the day, I find that there's occasions where maybe I'm driving down the road and God speaks to me about uh, somebody that comes to my heart and, and I just feel the urge to pray for their situation or pray for that person particularly. A lot of times an intercessor will basically intercede for the sake of others. You know, sometimes people get kind of beat up and you probably relate to those times where you feel kind of maybe down, discouraged, and it's nice to know that there's people that will pray for you, that will lift you up before God and ask for God to come and give you strength and helps. God wanted Abraham to be included in the journey in this passage that we just read. But at the end of the day, it still comes back to the fact that God has the final say. What I loved about it is that he included Abraham in the journey. So we're called to pray. In, April, in uh, Romans, rather, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. 1 Timothy 2, 1 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. 1 Samuel 12, 23 says, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. 
You know, we're called to pray for one another. And I believe God did that intentionally because we need one another. Even in, in the scriptures where it tells us, don't, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but come together to pray, to encourage, to help one another, to pray for one another's needs. It's such an integral part of growing in our faith. Daniel was another example in the scriptures. In Daniel chapter 9, it tells us how he prayed. It tells us in verse 2 that I understood the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. And verse 3 goes on, fervent response and self-denial. So I, I turned to God and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. In verse 5 of that chapter, he identified with the people. He said, we have sinned against you, God. We have done wrong. We have been wicked and we have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. And then he made that confession, I belong to this group. We did this, Lord. We turned our back on you. We didn't take time for you. We've, we've gone our own way. And when we look at the passage in chapter 9 of Daniel, we discover that he really focused on taking the time to pray and make his petitions known to God. He, he recognized that God was merciful and that God was righteous. And because God is who he is, that he would also forgive. And so he said, Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because of your city and your people who bear your name. And so he petitioned the Lord that he would answer. Uh, Psalm 46.1 reminds us that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in the time of trouble. And so when we come to God, we can bring our concerns and our worries and those issues that we need to pray about. And not only for ourselves, but those that are around us. When it comes to developing intercession in the Master Plan for Ministry by Elmore and Maxwell, they talk about a few ways of really growing in your faith and particularly in the development of your prayer. They compare it to like the union dynamic, first of all, where you are connecting to God through your worship and your interaction with him. The Bible says, enter his courts with thanksgiving, his gates with praise. You know, the, the idea is that we come before him in a worshipful attitude for who he is. Indeed, he is the master, the, the king of this universe. He's a God that wants to be engaged in our life, and, and we give him the honor that is due him. If you were to go to an earthly king or queen, you would follow protocols in order to be in their presence. And God calls us to be a people who come into his presence with the attitude of worship and praise, thanksgiving. Those are very, very important parts. But the whole thing there is that we're developing a, a union relationship with God. We're building relationship. Secondly, is that the idea of conception when it comes to prayer. And they state, conception is really that time of waiting on God and waiting for his direction in your life. You know, the Bible tells us not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. When we include God in the journey, God gives direction to us. There's a third point of gestation where we really identify the areas that need to be prayed about. And we acknowledge what they are, and then we pray until we get a breakthrough. That whole, that whole dynamic of prayer is, God, here is the situation. We don't come as beggars, but we come, Lord, here's the need. Here's the situation. I bring it before you because I believe you and I trust you according to your word, that you hear us, that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God that provides, that you are the Lord, my righteousness, that you are my salvation. You know, when we look at what God wants to do in our lives, he really invi invites us to understand the dynamic of prayer and how he wants to be a part of that and help us to pray through to see his work and will done in our lives and the lives of people around us. Sometimes prayer also requires a travailing part, which basically is where we labor through in prayer. We, we just keep pressing on till we have that answer. Daniel is a great example where he stayed uh, the course of, uh, uh, of 21 days praying and fasting and waiting on God till God gave him an answer. And then there's that beautiful point when you find that God gives you release in that prayer. You've been answering and now the release is seen in the evidence of the answer that's come. A lot of us can talk about how we prayed about different matters and we saw God bring solution to them. How he opened the doors for, for his will and his way to be accomplished and done. When it comes to God working in our lives, prayer is an incredible dynamic that has to be fostered and developed. 
Now, if we really stop and take a look at what's happening in Canada right now, there's a lot to pray about. We've seen the, the rising cases of COVID across different provinces. Right now, we have this pandemic is not over. We have, um, for whatever reason, we have an election process nationally. And uh, a lot of people are concerned, upset about the conditions of the health situation. And also now we've added the, the concern of our political arena as well. We have our children going back to school. The concerns again of COVID and the potential spread. Unfortunately, a few months ago, the discovery of all the unmarked graves of our our little indigenous uh, children that were were slaughtered and um, and were not accounted for. You know, where our nation is in a place where we need to pray. We need to pray for areas of forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. We need to pray for God's wisdom in leadership for our nation. And it's not so much uh, him or her kind of an attitude is, but Lord, we need the nation of Canada to experience your leadership and direction to help us through and give wisdom to those elected officials that will rise up to become the leaders in this next election. We need to pray for our schools. There are so many parents that are so concerned about what could potentially go wrong in the school system with their children being potentially exposed. The concerns and the worries of COVID. We, we have across Canada so many different cases that have now come again this, this next wave. We have, we have people that um, we've lost. In fact, this past week, one of my dear colleagues and friends, Pastor Jim Brown, uh, went into the presence of the Lord after battling through with COVID. You know, we pray for his, his family as they, as they go through this grieving time. And it's not just his family. There's many people across Canada that have been impacted. We're all crying for normalcy. We're tired of, of what's been happening. And folks, we need to pray. We need to ask God for, for his help at this time. As we go into this new season, we're coming into the fall now, uh, the unknown variables of what will take place. You know, there's so many things that have been happening in the world, even in the Middle East. Uh, you know, if you begin to really stop and begin to get aware of all the different things we can be praying for, the list continues on and on. And we haven't even really maybe even touched base with some of the family issues where people are struggling. There may be our loved ones that are battling addictions or battling ill health or, or battling uh, crises of, of, of faith or having crises in, in um, concerns of where their future will be because of everything that's been happening in, in our world and with COVID and all those kind of things. When we begin to look outside of our own door in our homes and begin to see the neighborhood around us, we begin to realize that there are a lot of people out there that need God's intervention. And we're called to pray. We're called to pray for them. We're called to pray for one another. I just want to encourage you today, when it comes to growing in prayer, when you begin to ask the question before the Lord, what can I pray for? And you begin to ask him, Lord, make me sensitive to be aware of what I need to pray for. You'll see that around you, there are a lot of things that you can actually pray about. There are a lot of things that will help you to begin to intercede and to begin to, to really petition God and to believe him for the answers that you're seeking. I just want to encourage you today that as we enter into this new fall season, that you would give room for God to speak into your heart to develop your prayer life, to begin to expand your understanding of what you can pray about and that God would begin to show you the relationship that he had with Abraham is something that he wants to develop with all of us as we begin to know him, interact with him, lay our lives before him to listen to his will and his direction, to pray in accordance to his will and also have that freedom to be able to come and converse with him with the things that we carry in our hearts and our lives. I just want to encourage you today, pray through, believe God, and know that he's with you and walks with you and hears your prayers. Let's pray. God, thank you today that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you, you hear the heart of man that cries out to you. You know the world's conditions. You know our personal conditions. You know our friends and our family's conditions. There are so many things to pray about. And Lord, help us not to lose sight of you the one who can answer prayer, 
the one who can intervene in our situations, the one that can help us in our journey of faith and our life. So we commit our time to you and we pray, God, lead us to become stronger disciples of you and developing a great walk of faith by growing in our prayer life with you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. I trust that the week ahead will be an opportunity for you to grow in prayer and to see the working of God in your life. Have a great week.